we're talking about developing patterns and and we know that you have this thing about you know top seven patterns so how is it that players go ahead and develop that so they have that as a resource to help them win okay great great question uh back in 2002 i did an encore case study with our then tennis academy and these are top kids in the nation but we took six kids and we let them train the old school way that we still see today at almost every academy around the world. Kids show up, they do mini tennis, 10, 15 minutes. They rally cross court to each other, down the line to each other. One person goes to the net and he volleys back to the other person. That person hits right to them. They put their finger up, they lob short right to the person. Essentially what we're doing is we're motor programming this whole idea of hit back to the player. But you see, Tennis and, and tournament play is really a game of keep away. It's not a game of catch. So let's repeat that. Tennis is not a game of catch. It's a game of keep away at high levels. So we took six kids in this, in this group, and we had them only train their top seven patterns of keep away. The other six kids in the group stick to the old school way of grooving back and forth to each other, essentially you know, playing catch back and forth. Well, the top seven patterns, uh, the favorite pattern to the do side, serve and then second shot. What's your favorite pattern to the add side? What's your favorite serve and favorite second shot? Then we went to three and four, which is return to serve patterns. So when you're returning a fast, big first serve, where do you stand? What's your shot selection? What are you trying to do? The fourth is returning a, a second serve. Where do you stand now against a weaker second serve? What's your favorite shot selection? Um, five is your favorite rally pattern. How do you get somebody vulnerable in a rally? When I was coaching uh, last year in Barcelona, they have a drill and the drill is called how to beat the Americans. And the drill was, it was pretty basic, but all they did was they had the Spanish kids hit super high and heavy to the backhand. The American kids would back up and hit a high strike zone ball. It lands short. Then the Spanish kids come, they come in, ahi, and they kill the winner. So it, that's their favorite mm -hmm. rally pattern. Um, there's also the favorite short ball option. And so I think it's important for us to know that there's four short ball options. You can come in and crush a winner. You can do approach shot volley. You can do a drop shot. You can roll your short angle side door shot and stay back on a short ball if you like, but you have short ball options. But what's your favorite short ball option? And the last is, um, what's your favorite net rushing pattern? Some people like to do serve and volley, chip and charge. Some do the old school approach volley. A lot of the girls, especially high school level girls, their best way to go to the net is moon ball approach to swing volley. Because now they have a sitting duck. They don't like speeding bullets coming at them for traditional volleys anymore, but they kind of dig the swing volley. So moon ball approach to swing volley. So. With this longer story, we have these top athletes write down their personal top seven. We only train their top seven for six weeks in a row. And then they played the other six in five matches straight. The team that was training this whole idea of top seven, they won every match easily against the other squad. Um, since then, the juniors that I've been training have won over 100 national singles titles because they're training playing keep away and everybody else is still training playing catch. Okay, so um, what year was, when did you start doing, taking that approach? 2002. 2002, so that's really fascinating. And, and the comment I have is that it's really awesome how that's affirmed by the new data, you know, that's been discovered about yeah. the zero, you know, 70% yeah. of the points are done in four shots, 20% are done in eight shots. And right then, on very few points last more than eight shots. So what is, what's your comment after hearing that the data supports that? Well, my, my comment is I have to apologize to all the kids that I taught from 1984 to 2002. Wow. Because it was my fault. Yeah. I, I had you guys out there playing catch. And then you go into the match, you have the court wide open, you hit a
right back to the opponent wow. because it, I was training you wrong. So I'm well, sorry. I would go the other way. I would gloat <laughs> about being an early adopter. But that's powerful, but, though, Bill. Like, yeah. That's yeah. well. I think I should have sorry, I should have figured this out earlier. Well, but yeah. hey, but it, we can only better go late than never. Right? Better late than never. I mean, you know. So there's an opportunity yeah. for a mind shift here to go. Wait a minute. If Frank can dramatically change his approach and his players benefit from that result, what would hold me back from also making that same shift? Because it's, it's we as coaches, the more we realize what we are doing yeah. and what we are not doing, then we can make a change. Yeah. But is not insanity doing the same thing over and over right again on. and expecting a different result? So, and being okay with the idea of going outside the box, the status quo, and taking a risk because there's no big rewards without a risk. And sometimes taking a risk is doing something different. And so if you're a parent out there with a kid in a group, it's absolutely fine if, if your kid wants to be part of the pack and they're happy being a great hobbyist. And then the tennis obviously is a great hobby for, for all of us. But I think, in my opinion, a junior that doesn't want to just be a hobbyist in the group shouldn't train in the group. Because if you're all training exactly the same way, you're not going to get ahead of anybody. you got to be okay with stepping outside of the box and trying some new things. So, And what, I'd risk. like to say, box? What box? Where's this box? Where's the box? Where's, Where's the, the box? box? I don't even see it. <laughs> yeah. Who created that Who box? Who made that box? Who made the box? Who made Put the it box. Way. Okay, so let's shift a little bit frank into uh you talk about the secondary strokes yeah and why they matter because we have primary so could you go into the idea of primary strokes versus secondary strokes yeah, sure. and sort of give us your experience in that and teaching on the course well it's based on um another analogy that we could use which is um painting we all can go to any staples and get a paint set and you get this primary strip of paint and this primary strip only has black, brown, blue, green, yellow. And you only have the primary basic colors. And we could be painting with these basic colors for 30 years. And we're always only going to be average painters. So we can be in the senior citizen old, old folks home painting still. And our paintings are not lifelike. They're not, there's no reality in, to them. But now the painters that actually understand there's not just primary paint. There's secondary colors. You don't have one green, you have six, seven versions of green. Now painters that paint with primary and secondary colors, now their paintings are lifelike. They can even make money on these paintings. So we try to get tennis players to understand the primary strokes, for example, a forehand might be their, their loop and their drive. It's great to have a primary stroke, but if you don't have your short angles, your high and heavies, your hard defensive slice, your drop shot slice, your defensive lobs. If you don't have all six forehands, you're only painting with primary colors. Mm. And this is one of the biggest reasons why most people cannot beat the dreaded pusher retrievers, because you need secondary strokes to beat a retriever. Mm -hmm. So against a retriever, you need your short angles, you need high and heavy moon ball approach to swing volleys. And again, a swing volley is not a primary volley. A primary volley is when you stand at the net, the coach feeds it right to you, you have one finger in your nose, and you're just doing this all day. You're not going to use that. You're not going to volley hard deep. You're going to do drop volleys or swing volleys, which is secondary strokes. So we'll come do a quick review. There's not one forehand, there's six. There's not one backhand, there's six. You have your drive. We'll go through them. Drive, your short angle side door, your high and heavy, your hard slice, your, your drop shot, and then you have your, your defensive lob, which is probably as high as the lights at your club. Or if you're an indoor player, you're skimming the roof with your, your defense. On serving, you have a flat, a kick, and a slice. You have a whole tool belt. On volleys, you have your primary punch volley, drop volleys, half volleys, swing volleys. If you want to be a high-performance player, if you want to play a college ball, if you want to even win club tournaments, you need primary and secondary strokes in your tool belt. So, what would Batman be without his utility belt? That's a good point. Man, that is great. He That's and Batman is amazing because of his tool belt. <laughs> his tool he belt. He can just access so many awesome. Like he gets in those fights and he's like, "I'm just not going to throw a bat like 
uh, ninja uh, <laughs> uh, star right at you. I'm gonna pull He's got out my off. cable, man. I'm gonna and mess you up. Do you remember when we were kids? There was a show MacGyver. <laughs> Do you guys remember that one, MacGyver? Yes, mm -hmm. MacGyver. It's yeah. back on now. Yes. It's a brand new version of it. Really? Mm -hmm. And that guy has a tool belt. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There you oh, go. Yeah. yeah. Versatile. Got to be versatile. Versatility. 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 There you go. All right. Now, uh, this one, this question sounds kind of scary to me because, you know, it's kind of got a controversial word in it. Mm. Um, so talk to us a little bit about opponent profiling. Mm. Oh, like... Like yes. Criminal Minds TV show? Yes. Man, we shouldn't profile, yeah. should we? I don't know. Profiling is... I don't is, know. Um, Maybe it's helpful. Could Sometimes, be, if you uh, do it the right way, right? I don't know. Opponent profiling. Right yes. Maybe opponent. Well, to me, so. opponent profiling is kind of based on paying attention. It's all about paying attention. Yeah. And, and when you're dissecting your opponent, you want to look at things like what style are they playing? Are they a hard-hitting baselander? they a pusher retriever. And keep in mind, though, if you're playing somebody and they're a hard-hitting baseliner and you just beat them 6-2, only a dummy is going to stick to the same losing plan. They're probably going to go to plan B. So the second set, they might come out as a retriever or they might be a net rusher. So what style do they play? In opponent profiling, you actually want to be able to know, this is advanced, but you want to be able to figure out their top seven. Because if you know their top seven patterns, What's their favorite short ball option? Well, I know this girl likes to come in and drive it down the line for a winner. Well, if you know what their short ball option is, you shut it down. If you know their favorite serve pattern on the ad side, you shut it down. Now, if you understand their top seven and you're running your top seven, guess who's going to win all those tipping point matches? Mm. Now, when you get to that 4-4, four, 5-5 four, five, five, tiebreaker, you're doing what you do best. You're shutting down what they're doing best. Boom, you're going to start winning all those tipping point matches. So opponent profiling, though, also could be basic elements like what's the opponent's favorite strengths and weaknesses and strokes? What's their favorite strengths and weaknesses in, in on-court movement and, and positioning? And maybe another thing might be, uh, this sounds a little bit more fancy than it really is, but frustration tolerance levels. People have shot tolerance, mm -hmm. frustration tolerance, What's upsetting them? It would be, you know, frustration tolerance. Shot tolerance is how many balls can they get in per point comfortably before they do something reckless. So noticing the oddities of the other your opponent mm -hmm. uh, and what they're starting to do regularly is yeah. a powerful is a really powerful way to uh, learn how to win more points. Yeah, I think so. And I think you know we're we always talk about tendencies. What are their tendencies? But um, so now we're into the topic. Even how do you spot how do you spot tendencies? So here's how, here's my take when I'm when I'm training players. I try to get them to realize that there's a really powerful myth, which is keep your eyes on the ball. That's silly. Coaches um, don't do that. Don't teach your students that because you don't always keep your eye on the ball. So here's what I'm saying. So hear me out on this one. Then you can make your choice whether I'm I'm nuts or not. So. It's broad vision and narrow vision. When the ball is incoming into you, this is keep your eye on the ball, and that's spot on. You want to watch the ball as it's leaving the opponent's racket. You want to watch it come off the court into your racket. But now when the ball leaves your racket and it's headed in towards the opponent's side, don't just simply watch the ball anymore. Now you want to shift to broad vision. Narrow vision, broad vision. Broad vision is picking up things like where is the ball landing on their court? It's called zonal tennis. What zone is your ball landing on? Are they on defense, neutral, or offense, depending on where, where your ball's landing? You want to look at things like, Sterling, you're talking about picking up tendencies. When the person is in the backcourt falling back with a strike zone above their head, what's the tendency? Are they going to hit that ball short? And there's a little bit of yin and yang. If they're on defense, you're on offense. So if you're going to work on your speed around the court. Don't just work on foot speed. Work on um, cognitive processing speed, which is broad vision. So here are some of the things you're going to pick up. When you hit a ball to the other person, pay attention to where the ball's landing on their court. Pay attention to where they're standing on their court. That dictates their options. Pay attention to their strike zones. Are they hitting the ball way down by their socks? Are they uncoiling waist level? Are they falling back up by their head? Strike zones, right? 
That's really big. Last couple of things might be pay attention to the opponent's swing speed, swing length. Swing speed, how fast? Swing length, how big? And obviously, just me even sitting here on the couch, if I have a, a swing speed, swing length of a slice drop shot backhand like this, that's going to look very different than a full looping monster ground stroke. So you're paying attention to broad vision and narrow vision, and now you're spotting tendencies throughout the match. So then that relates really well to the, wis the great wisdom of Bill Tilden, who said, you know, find out what your opponent's favorite shot is and never give it to them. Yeah, right on. And find out what their least favorite shot is and hit it there when you need that point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, though, that's some, some of the things that when we, when we watch juniors, even at the national level, often they're not doing that. Um, I had a young boy from San Diego, top 10 in the nation, I'm charting him through this whole match, and I go, how did you do? Well, he lost the match three and three. He goes, well, I think I did pretty well. I go, well, how, how often did you serve to his weaker backhand? He goes, well, most of the time I did. And I show him the chart, and he served uh, 26 out of 30 second serves to the opponent's killer forehand. And he wasn't even aware of it. And he's top in the nation. So, Bill, you got your spot of it. You got to pay attention to these, these things. And mm -hmm. it's... It's not just if you're a coach out there or a parent, it's not just how you hit, but it's where are you hitting, why, when, not just how. We have to all get off that how and perfectionism and form. That's not the whole the whole bag of wax right there. So let's let's put a wrap on it. I mean what's what's the overall for this the for this time that we've had here? What are the real you know, if we can outline the take homes? Well I think the biggest take home nowadays is it's not a one size fits all approach to, to sports, to tennis. It's based on your brain type, your body type. It's absolutely fine if you're a four or five ball hit, hit, hit. Here, look, some of the best players in the history of the game, whether it was back in the Pete Sampras days or the Serena Williams days, they only like to hit four balls per point. They're really not interested in 30 ball rallies. And so do you have to hit 30 balls in? And the answer is no, you don't. You've, fit the style to your personality, your body type, your brain type, and go from there. So customization would probably be the most important thing. Mm -hmm.